You will hear a telephone conversation about a car insurance claim. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 1 to 5. Good afternoon. What are insurance? This is Janet speaking. How may I help you? Yes, hello. Um, I would like to make a claim on my car insurance, please. Certainly, sir. First of all, I'd like to inform you that all of our calls are recorded for monitoring and training purposes. Is that OK? That's OK. Could you please tell me your full name? Sure, it's Mr Bennett Fisher. OK, sorry, how do you spell your surname? It's spelled F-I-S-C-H-E-R. Great, thank you. I see that you have taken out a third-party fire and theft premium with us on a 2013 light blue Volkswagen Passat. Is that OK? Uh, yes, well, almost. Uh, the colour is not light blue, it's light green. OK, thank you for updating your information with us. What is the nature of your claim with us today? Last weekend, I had driven up to York on business and left my car in a monitored car park. However, it was only monitored until 8pm, and I did not return to collect it until 9.30pm, after which no car park staff were present. When I arrived at the car park, my car wasn't there. It must have been stolen. I see. Were there any valuable items left in your car which could have been seen from outside? Well, I had recently bought quite an expensive radio for my car, but the front panel is detachable, and I always stow it in my glove compartment. So, no, there wouldn't have been anything valuable on display. OK, Mr Fisher. Thank you for that information. I'm going to send you some forms through the mail for you to fill in. Before I can do that, I need to ask you a couple more questions. Is that OK? Of course. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 6 to 10. Thanks, Mr Fisher. First of all, could you let me know your policy number, please? Of course. I have it right here. It's G34C245. G34C245. Thanks. And the type of claim? Shall we say stolen car? Yes, the car was definitely stolen. I reported it to the police immediately. I actually have the report number here, if that's of any use. No, not right now. But keep hold of that, as we will need to see a copy of the police report eventually. Which police station did you report the offence at? York Police Station. Was it your first time in York? No, but it was the first time I'd driven there. I, I usually take the train. Were you aware that the car park was only manned until 8pm? No, I, I was not aware of that. Were there any signs put up on the premises that informed car owners of the risks of leaving their cars after normal operating hours? Yes, but they said the car park was going to be guarded until 10pm, at which point the entrance is barred so no cars can come in or out. Was any reason given for that sudden change? The police informed me that the staff on duty that night had left on an urgent call. I believe it was something about a family member being admitted to hospital. Were there any personal items left in your car? Yes. First of all, there was the car radio I mentioned before. Oh yes, of course. Anything else? Just some CDs and an old jacket. Right. Thank you, Mr Fisher. I have everything I need for now and will send these forms out to you shortly. When you get them, please fill them out with as much information as you can and, where possible, include copies of any relevant documents to support your claim, such as police reports and registration details. Once you have returned that to us, we can then start to assess whether you will be eligible to receive compensation. Do you have any further questions for me today? No, that's all. Uh, thanks for your help. Section 2. You are going to hear an interviewer who is interviewing Alan. He made a great discovery of Mungo National Park. First look at questions 11 to 15. As you listen to the first part of the interview, answer questions 11 to 15. An event occurred in 1996 over a period of three days that attracted considerable attention at the time and led to a new find in Mungo National Park, which is the focal point of the Willandra Lakes World Heritage Area in New South Wales, Australia. I talked to Alan Moore, the organizer of this trip, about his experience. Alan, what was the purpose of your trip? Well, as you know, I love the outback and lead tours of people wanting to go into more remote parts of the country. However, 
I thought it was time for me too to have a holiday. So I packed up my family and we went to Mungo National Park. Why did you choose this location? It holds a record of Aboriginal life stretching back over 40,000 years. And of course, I wanted my young kids to be amazed by the main feature of the park, the remarkable Walls of China, as they're called, where wind and water erosion have exposed this long history. I see. What was the weather like? It was unusual for that time of year. The rain was just one continual downpour after another. We were always soaked to the skin. So we decided to cut our holiday short and only stayed three days in the end. However, it was eventful. The obvious problem was to get back to the nearest town, a small place called Boronga. But the dirt roads out there are always impassable after rain, so we settled down for a long, wet wait in the park. We didn't really mind because the scenery was so interesting. However, the kids wandered away without our noticing, and eventually we realized they must be lost. So we used our two-way radio to contact the park rangers and the police, and a helicopter was sent. Luckily, the kids were found within a few hours, but they'd made an important discovery. Now look at questions 16 to 20. As the talk continues, answer questions 16 to 20. So the trip was also eventful for another reason, wasn't it? Yes, yes. They led us to some ancient aboriginal art. The kids had taken shelter in a very small, low cave that was difficult to see from the outside. We were lucky to have another family camping in our location. When they heard us calling the kids, they immediately helped us search for them, and as the hours went by, they also provided us with much-needed support and encouragement. We really appreciated their help, and as we were already soaked through after looking for the kids for a couple of hours, they even made sure we had enough dry clothes to wear. The park ranger managed to get through to us to lead the search, and when the helicopter pilot notified us by two-way radio that he'd seen the children but was unable to land nearby, we were able to eventually find them very excited about what was in their little cave. And what did you think of their cave? Well, after squeezing in, I must say I was impressed and managed to take a few photos of it before we left. There were many faint markings and dots on the wall. It was difficult to tell what they represented because they were so small, but people from the museum who have since visited there said the markings were similar to some other findings in the area and later confirmed they were very old. Although it's now a protected site, the children like to call it their cave and are allowed to visit it when a ranger can go with them. Thank you, Alan. If you go to Mungo National Park, you can see the entrance to the cave and some of Alan's photos at the ranger's station. Alan continues to lead tour groups in the outback, and if you want further information... This is the end of Section 2. Now you have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. You are going to listen to a conversation between a tutor and two students. In the first part of the discussion, they talk about a fellow student. First, look at questions 21 to 23. As you listen, answer the questions. Write no more than two words for each answer. Ah, Francis and Steve, hi. Now, before we start the tutorial, am I right in thinking that you haven't heard about Lorraine? No. What about her? Um, she's already left. What? Well, she hasn't told anyone. You sound surprised. Uh, weren't you half expecting it? Yes, but she could at least have told us, though. We've been on the course together for the past three years, and it would have been nice to know. She always was the sort to keep herself to herself. Yes, I know what you mean. Did she give any reason? Well, she got that job. What? Yes, and she's been given permission to leave, as there's only a week to go before the end of the course. But she'll be back for the exam week. Oh, well, we'll just have to catch her on the mobile after the class. She's gone back to Wales first. Oh, dear. We'll get hold of her on the mobile. She did say that it might not be possible to contact her for a couple of weeks. Oh, OK. If that is what she wants. Before the conversation continues... Look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen to the second part of the discussion. The tutor and the two students are talking about assessment marks. For questions 24 to 30, there are four alternatives. A, B, C and D. Decide which alternative is the most suitable answer and circle the correct letter. Right, to work. 
We're here to look at your assessment marks for your coursework. I take it you haven't seen them yet. No, <laughs> not yet. Well, you'll both be pleased. In fact, very pleased. Yes. Francis, you have come out with the top mark in the year. Oh. You have, in fact, got a starred first. Wow. Aren't you pleased, Francis? Yes, I'm just speechless. <laughs> And、um, what about me? Well, Steve, you got a first as well. <laughs> oh, I don't believe it. <laughs> you might have done even better, but there were a few faults with the five thousand word project you did on traffic management. And what about the book review we had to do? Yours was, I can safely say, the best we have ever had. <laughs> You're kidding. I'm not. In fact, you have won the departmental prize for the piece. It's a pity, really, that your project wasn't of the same calibre. It's still not bad at all, though, is it? It certainly isn't. What do you think were the faults with your project?、Uh, I just wasn't very happy with the conclusion, and I got myself in a bit of a twist with the argument about road pricing. By and large, your overall conclusions were okay, and I would say that your thoughts on road pricing were quite original. The problem was more with the actual end. It was a bit disappointing. You started off well, but then it ended rather suddenly, as if you got fed up with it. <laughs> yes, I did kind of stop fairly abruptly. I couldn't think of much to say, even though I knew it was important. Yes, that section needed a bit more work on it. But as I said, by and large, it was very good. And Francis,、mm -hmm. your project was excellent, so much so that we think you should take it further and perhaps do a PhD or at least an MPhil. What do you think? Um, <laughs> I hadn't really thought about it. I've just been concerned with getting through this final year and getting all the coursework and exams out of the way. I can understand that. But I do think that you ought to consider it seriously. If you perform as well in your exams as in your project work, you're on course for a first. Do you think that I'd get funding for it? Well, any grant will be discretionary, but you have as good a chance as anyone else. I'd even say a much better one.、Mm. If you do get a first, it'll be the only one we've had in this department for three years, and I'd be happy to be your supervisor. Thanks, I'd like that. Do you think I should start applying for it now, or wait until after the exams? I think you must really start thinking about it as soon as you can.、Mm. And Steve, what about you? Have you thought about going on to do research? I have thought about it, but I have a job lined up if I get a good degree. And quite honestly, I am fed up with not having enough money to do the things I would like to do. <laughs> I can understand that. Is there anything that either of you would like to talk about? Yeah, I have a couple of things I'd like to ask, if you don't mind. Okay, we have roughly twenty、uh, minutes left. So, Steve, would you like to go first? Right.、Um... That's the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a conversation about astronomy. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. This is magic time from the BBC. I am Faith. In today's program, we invite a professor of astronomy. Welcome, Lewis. Thanks a lot, Faith. What magic information will you introduce to us? We all know the Leonidas in August are coming. So today, let's talk about meteors. Good topic. At one time or another, almost everyone has glimpsed a swift little streak of light dashing across the night sky. Nearly everyone makes wishes when they see them, and blame both good and bad luck on their presence. Yes, these sudden celestial visitors are meteors. We often call it shooting star. The glowing trails are caused by the incineration of a piece of celestial debris entering our atmosphere. Many meteors are quick flashes, but some last long enough for us to track their brief course across the sky. Right. Now and then, a meteor truly will light up the night, blazing brighter than Venus, although rarely even brighter than the moon. 
leaving in its wake a dimly glowing trail that may persist for minutes. Lewis, can we see some meteors every night in one year? Yes. Under a dark sky, any observer can expect to see between two and seven meteors each hour any night of the year. These are sporadic meteors. Sporadic meteors? Yes. Their source bodies, meteorids, are part of the dusty background of the inner solar system. Several times during the year, Earth encounters swarms of small particles that greatly increase the number of meteors. The result is a meteor shower, during which observers may see dozens of meteors every hour. Concentrations of material within the swarms may produce better than average displays in some years, with rates of hundreds per hour, and were treated to a truly amazing display in which thousands of visible meteors can be seen for a brief period. The phenomenon is called meteor storms, which are more magnificent than meteor showers. Aha! That's wonderful! Definitely. The meteors that appear during a meteor shower seem to come from one point in the sky. This illusion is an effect of perspective, just as a roadway seems to converge in the distance. Usually, meteor showers get the name of the constellation from which the meteors appear to radiate. Such as during the Perseid shower in August, meteors seem to streak from a point in the constellation Perseus. When is the biggest meteor storm? According to records, in 1833, a storm of 60,000 meteors an hour shocked the world. 60,000? That's unbelievable! By the 1860s, scientists had known that many meteor showers were annual, including the normally placid Leonids, which produced the big storm, and that they were somehow related to comets. Really? Yes, but most of the meteors people have seen during one of the annual showers arise from fluffy particles not much larger than sand grains. As a particle enters Earth's atmosphere, it collides with gas atoms and molecules. The particle becomes wrapped in a glowing sheaf of heated air and vaporised material boiled off its own surface. Whether a meteor is very near to us when it appears? No. In fact, it is an illusion. However, even well-trained professionals can be fooled, such as airline pilots have swerved to avoid meteors that were actually 160 kilometres away. A meteor that appears brighter than any of the stars and planets is a fireball. Fireball? That's so interesting! Yeah, most meteors are seen 80 to 120 kilometres above the ground. Sometimes, someone will claim to see a fireball land on a hilltop. But in fact, a real fireball first appears at a height of about 125 kilometres and loses its brightness while still at least 20 kilometres above the ground. Yes. What colours do meteors have? Usually, most meteors look white, but some also appear blue, green, yellow, orange, or even red. What will happen if a meteoroid gets to the surface of the Earth without being completely vaporised? It will be a meteorite. I heard meteorites were long ago thought to be cast down as gifts from angels. Yes, and others thought the gods were displaying their anger. Really? As late as the 17th century, many believed they fell from thunderstorms. They were nicknamed thunderstones. Many scientists didn't believe the accounts of people who claimed to have seen meteors, and some experts were sceptical that stones could fall from the clouds or the heaven. Yes. One of the most significant meteorite events in recent history destroyed hundreds of square miles of forest in Siberia, on June the 30th, 1908. According to local witnesses, a ball of fire streaked through the sky and seemed to enter the atmosphere at an oblique angle. It exploded, sending out hot winds and loud noises and shaking the ground enough to break windows in nearby villages. Small particles blown into the atmosphere lit the night sky for several days. So. Nowadays, the prevailing theory holds that a meteor exploded just above the surface. Yes. Most impact craters and basins larger than the meteor crater are heavily worn away or have been buried by rocks and dirt 
as the Earth's surface changed. At present, Chicxulub Basin, centered in Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, is the largest one. The diameter of basin is around 300 kilometers. Rock samples obtained by drilling into the basin show that an asteroid struck the Earth there about 65 million years ago. Does that the same period with the dinosaurs disappeared? That's right. Many scientists believe this debris caused climate changes, which made the dinosaurs not survive. We do really hope that will never happen again. Right. Okay. Thanks for watching today's program. See you next week. This is the end of section four.